<laughs> Good evening, bonsoir, Tansi. I am honored to be here tonight on Treaty 6 ground to discuss a very different kind of reconciliation. We're going to be looking back tonight at the watershed moment in history, in the history of this province, in the history of human rights, the case known as Vreen versus Alberta. And I'm here tonight with some of the people who were on the front lines at the center of that fight for equality and dignity. I'm going to start first with some housekeeping. I'm going to keep this short because if you've ever seen my house, you would know that I hate housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be introducing our panelists and leading them in conversation. I'm going to be asking them questions. Some are my questions and some of the questions are based on the questions that were submitted online earlier. We're not going to be having questions from the audience tonight, but afterwards all of the panelists will be mingling and there will be more desserts and uh, they will be happy, I'm sure, to talk to you if you've got questions at that point. Who here has a cell phone? Who <laughs> <laughs> doesn't? I do. Could you please set your phone to vibrate or buzz? But don't turn it off because we want you to live tweet. And the hashtag for this evening is Vreend20. Uh, you can see it up on the screen there in case you didn't know how to spell Vreend. You will by the end of tonight. <laughs> And I'm very competitive with my hashtagging. I would like us to trend in Canada. I would like all of Canada to know what we're talking about here tonight. Because all of Canada should know how important Alberta was to this fight, for, for good and for bad. So I think that's all the housekeeping. I won't be doing any when I get home tonight either. <laughs> so let me not waste any more time now. We're going to introduce you to the panel. I'm going to get very short introductions. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause until the end. So to my immediate left. Michael Fair is the chair of the University of Alberta's Board of Governors and a long time, a very long time, <laughs> advocate for gay rights. <laughs> he was also, of course, Edmonton's first openly gay city councillor. And next to Michael is Madam Justice Sheila Greckel, a member of the Alberta Court of Appeal. And 20 years ago, she was the lead counsel for Delwyn Freed. You're still a member of the Court of Appeal. You're not running away yet. No. I'm no. Still working. Still working. <laughs> And Doug Stollery, who you've met earlier this evening, is of course the Chancellor of the University of Alberta, but he was also 20 years ago Sheila's co-counsel, uh, both in the Court of Appeal and at the Supreme Court. And people may not know to what extent the Vreen case only made it to the Supreme Court because of the generosity of Doug and his family who largely underwrote uh, the challenge and the expense. Next to Doug is Madam Justice Julie Lloyd of the Family Court of Alberta. She was appointed last year as Alberta's first openly gay judge. That took a while. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time of the Vreen case, she was, as she put it to me, a tiny baby lawyer. Um, <laughs> and she was an intervener representing the Canadian Bar Association at the Supreme Court. And besides Julie is uh, Dr. Christopher Wells, Assistant Professor of Education Policy and Faculty Director for the Institute of Sexual Minority Studies and Services, which when I say it makes me sound like a sibilant snake. <laughs> 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 so you were supposed to hold your applause to the end. You didn't do that. You can applaud now anyway. <laughs> and before we begin, um, Claire is going to put up for us a little tiny clip. The sound quality is not great, so we chose a very short clip. But this is Sheila Greckel's opening remarks to the Supreme Court of Canada as she is explaining who Delwyn Vreend was and why this case mattered. So I thought it was a good place for us to start, too. The record shows that in January of 1990, Mr. Vreend questioned the administrative handbook of King's College which had a reference to, quote, immorality as a ground for termination. He was asked about and confirmed his homosexuality. Discussion ensued within the college for a period of a year, after which Mr. Vreen was asked to resign, and upon declining, he was fired. On reading this material, one is immediately struck by the fact that Mr. Vreen must, in essence, go to bat for himself in his employment setting over what this court has described as his personhood, a characteristic fundamental to his personhood. He was, in essence, asked by his employer to deny what Mr. Justice Laforet called in Egan a deeply personal characteristic which is either unchangeable or changeable only at unacceptable personal cost. 
for any of us in the courtroom on any ground, and as women of my generation well know, to explain that we are as good as, despite the characteristic that is questioned, is profoundly humiliating. But none of us who sometimes face that discrimination, and as the cases indicate, often we, or we all do at some point in our lives, none of us is asked to pretend that we are not what we are. In a word, to deny ourselves. So I want to start, I mean, we really started with Sheila, but now we're going to start with Michael. I want you to give us, if you would, a bit of a prequel. Delwyn Vreend was fired in 1991. Yep. That's not so very long ago, but it's before most undergraduates at the U of A were born. What was life like for gay Albertans in the 1990s? Um, well, in, in uh, the um, as we approach the, the 1990s, uh, we just come through uh, a number of, of uh, aspects that, that were, I think, uh, relatively difficult. One of them being the, the uh, AIDS that that, that was uh, first um, identified in Edmonton in 1984, which was uh, taking in lives of a number of people. Also, uh, it took a lot of energy to be able to respond to that. And there was a great deal of, um, oh, I remember, um, too well that that uh, people who would say, well, you know, people who get AIDS, they deserve it. They should all die anyway. Um, they're just gay kind of thing, and and they have no place here, et cetera, et cetera. And that, and I remember hearing that on talk shows because I was oftentimes asked to be on talk shows. That was part of you know we didn't have uh, internet or or tweet. Uh, we couldn't tweet in those days. It was talk shows <laughs> that that people would call into, kind of thing, and that and and so there was a great deal of of um, those kinds of things going on. Um, uh, and uh, many people, including myself, um, were quite concerned about um, how we were being seen a as individuals and as citizens of the city um, and how we, we were being treated um, and that. And, and people were being discriminated against, we argued, and, and individuals who, who fought, thought they were being discriminated against and were went to the Human Rights Commission, which could not take the cases because the, the, the uh, Individual Rights Protection Act did not include sexual orientation. I remember meeting with a couple of, of individuals from, from Grand Prairie who, who had been in, in a situation where they were discriminated against and they, they were told that, you know, nice but go home um, because there was nothing that could be done um, uh, with that. Um, and, and I think th there was a sense of, of um, um, having been uh, see, in my case, there was a sense of seeing a lot of people that I knew who were in their early 20s and maybe 30 who were dying and had died of AIDS. And then we had this kind of thing going on at the same time. It was a very ugly time in, in many kinds of ways. Um, and, 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 um, and, and for reasons I don't exactly know, um, in, in, um, 19, in St. Patrick's Day in, Saint, uh, in, in 1992, I decided to run for city council. <laughs> <laughs> and I won. Twenty six so, I mean, even even more of a surprise. <laughs> so you were out, which was hard. Yes, I but was. In also well, I, in also hard. Was there a lot of I mean for, for people who were closeted, they you needed a big closet. Yeah, there were a lot of people in the closet, yes. <laughs> the sad thing about being in the closet is that you didn't know who else was in the closet. It wasn't one big closet. <laughs> <laughs> it was a whole bunch of little closets. And everybody had their own. And you kind of thought you were the only person in that closet. Yeah. So Sheila, Michael mentioned the AIDS crisis as a, as a thing that had a huge impact on the way people talked about homosexuality. And that relates, I think, to the way that you first became involved with the Vreen case. Um, this, my involvement predates even that. Yes. And Michael and I were discussing that earlier tonight. It was the Pisces gay bath raid in 1981. And wow. um, it was really an unbelievable time. People were charged and arrested and taken almost immediately to trial, whether or not they had defense counsel. And so my partner was asked to represent one of the uh, accused and I got involved because 
we needed to stop the court proceedings in order for people to get counsel and have a proper trial. And I know Kathy Miller is here tonight. Her father, Chief Justice Miller at that time, um, gave us a prohibition order, which we prepared in two hours that morning to stop the court proceedings in order that we could have a test trial to challenge community standards on the charges that these people were facing. So that was 1981. Right. And, and I was part of a, a group that, that formed of a number of other people who were gay and lesbian called the Privacy Defense Committee, working with people like Sheila and, and others, um, and also uh, raising money and um, trying to provide some support to people who had been arrested. Because wow. there were 53 people arrested, 55. 55. 53 55. or 55 people that were, were arrested um, at, at about one o'clock in the morning kind of thing and taken in paddy wagons and taken off to, to court to the old uh, courthouse and, and a justice of the peace and I, I, maybe a judge at three in the morning interviewed everyone and decided and and, and then charged them all under the federal legislation a uh, federal criminal law has been found in of a found, body house the founders of a body house yeah. wow. and so the next thing that leads into the aids crisis and yes. i know dr larry jewell is here tonight yes. and he he and some of the real pioneers of the movement of the community in, it would be 1984 by then. Yep. And they asked me to sit on the AIDS network board in order to provide some assistance, but it was the, really the community that began to act, to become active. And it was Barry Bro and Maureen Irwin and Michael Fair, of course, and Dr. Warnicke and Dr. Jewell, who's here tonight. And, and they fought really hard to help people who were sick and I really honestly did not understand the import of this until I saw that play Angels in America and I realized how it was almost not even possible to acknowledge what was going on and to get the medical treatment that people oh, yeah. needed more so here of course it was available than there but people were already firing employees because they yep. were suspected that they might be ill because of AIDS and I personally met people like that or tried to represent them so that was 84, 1984 as I recall. So then how did you end up becoming Del and Vreen's lawyer? So then as a result of that I knew people in the community for a long period of time. Michael I've probably known 40 some years. And then I'm only 18. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, then um, and then Doug Elliott was a national lawyer representing the gay community, EGAL, which was a national organization and he just called one day out of the blue and asked whether I would be prepared to represent EGAL and then Egal undertook the defense of Delwyn, and so that's how it all started. And I'm sure Michael had something to do with it, I'm guessing, <laughs> and the other people in the room here. So. All right, and then how did you rope Doug into this? Okay, well, <laughs> 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 I think you already told that story, but he's got a little different version than I do, and I'm not going to fight over whose memory is better, but <laughs> this is my memory. Anyway, I was sitting at my desk one day, and I got this beautiful letter, and I didn't know Doug except by reputation, and of course he's you know, got an amazing academic background, Harvard, everything. And it had a check in it to contribute to our, our expenses. And he said, if there's anything you can do, please call. And so, of course, I needed his brains more than his money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, he came, he volunteered, and, and then, you know, a lifelong friend was born out of that, right. too. So. But, uh, the, your version of the story is slightly more colorful. <laughs> <laughs> It's got the same bones. <laughs> I saw Sheila, it was at a gay pride parade. After the parade, she was out shilling for money. <laughs> I was at the parade. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, I was the only one who took her up on it. Um, so Not I wrote, for fees, and, let's be clear. <laughs> and, and, and my thought was, well, you know, I, I was a solicitor. I drafted contracts. I knew absolutely nothing about the charter, which didn't exist when I went to law school. So I thought, well, maybe I could, like, photocopy or something. <laughs> it turns out in those days, people were not banging down the doors to represent a gay man. So <laughs> there I was. So how did you, I, I want to put this, I mean, to us today, it seems obvious that you were in the moral right. But the legal issues were more complicated than that because you weren't fighting a government's actions you were fighting a government's refusal to act, a refusal to change the law. So how did that complicate the legal case that you had to make? The case was complicated on lots of fronts. Uh, when we started the case, um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, says nothing about sexual orientation. And so we had to argue that although it 
it didn't say sexual orientation, it should. And because it should, then so should Alberta's legislation. Fortunately for us, just before we got to the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada found that sexual orientation, though not actually stated in the Charter, actually belonged in the Charter. But in a case of absolutely blatant discrimination, it was uh, federal pension legislation that said that same-sex couples were not entitled to the same pension rights as opposite-sex couples. They found that was not discriminatory, which is astonishing. So then we had our case, which was about what a government hadn't done, facing a court that found even obvious discrimination wasn't discrimination. So that was the, that was the challenge. So Julie, that, that case is the Egan decision. Mm -hmm. That's right. But did Egan give your, your arguments a way in? Yes, clearly. It, it, the broken pottery, I guess, of that decision at least had in it that gift that sexual orientation was, in fact, an analogous ground under the um, Charter, under Section 15 of the Charter. So that gave us the way in, or gave um, everyone a way in, to be able to um, speak about sexual orientation as one of the protected grounds of discrimination in the country. And there's another case, which I thought was quite fascinating, about whether British lawyers could be members of the British Columbia Law Society. <laughs> that also, I mean, because that was, that was what really established the fact that you could have an analogous ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which so well, gave, gave for British said, lawyers who won't. You know. Section 15 says there'll be no discrimination, blah blah blah, and in particular, no discrimination on the following grounds. And so the case was made by Sheila very effectively before the court, and Justice Lemaire said, "But it says in particular, which suggests that the list is not finite." And so that was a clever way that I guess it was drafted to be open-ended to ultimately contemplate including unwritten grounds. Well, the idea was that all historically disadvantaged groups should fall within that un or that infinite category, the infinite list of categories in Section 15. Yes. All right, so I want to take you back first to the Court of Appeal. Now, you had, to, I mean, just to give you the pricey, in case you did not read my really excellent piece. <laughs> <laughs> In case you read it quickly and have forgotten, um, <laughs> Delwyn Vreen, first with different legal counsel, went before the uh, Court of Queen's bench to appeal his inability to go to the Human Rights Commission. And Madam Justice Ann Russell, in the Court of Queen's bench, ruled in a very eloquent judgment in Delwyn Vreen's favor and said that the province had to read in sexual orientation. The province was not happy. And so uh, the government of Ralph Klein appealed that decision, which was how Sheila and Doug ended up in front of the Court of Appeal. So mm. what happened when you got to the Court of what? Appeal? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to stop to say that we, we actually had a legal team even at the Court of Appeal, and yes. we had two other lawyers. June Ross, who was a professor of constitutional law, I don't know if she's here tonight, and Joanne Combs, who was in our office. So we had, I think, really amazingly strong um, work done in order to prepare for that case. So there were four of us at that point. And so we got up there to argue the same arguments that made it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and we had a very hostile reception. One of the things that I remember we tried to do in t anticipation of the hearing was to put in an affidavit what I guess would be described as a Brandeis <coughs> brief for those law students in the, in the room, um, putting in evidence of all of the harms visited upon gay and lesbian people, and now it would be transgender as well, the psychological harms, the suicide rates, the, you know, an affidavit from Dr. Lauren Warnicke indicating that um, there were real harms. People were dying as a result of discrimination, literally dying or, or committing suicide and, and so on, or uh, having other very adverse effects. So that was not permitted. Um, and then when we, by the time we got to the Supreme Court of Canada, Lauren had published an article on that subject 
in a peer-reviewed journal. And so it was completely legitimate to put that in among our authorities. And that was the first Donnybrook, right? <laughs> McLeod basically accused me of being unethical for putting that into the materials. So I think at that point he turned around and wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to be facing us for the balance of the hearing. I mean, just, just imagine mm -hmm. this. Sheila Greckel gets up in front of the Court of Appeal, Alberta's highest court, and the judge who is at the center of that panel swivels in his chair. I mean, I mean what, how did you react when he turned, he literally turned his back on you? I think there was a certain amount of anger by that point. <laughs> <laughs> and anger will take you a long way. Adrenaline and anger, I don't know how you remember it, but I, I remember being angry. And I'm thinking, I don't have a lot of court experience. <laughs> Sheila and say, this strikes me as not a good sign. <laughs> so, unsurprisingly, perhaps, you lost at the Court of Appeal. Yeah, right. Did. Yeah, and <laughs> resoundingly. <laughs> and Mr. Justice McClung wrote, among other things, that there was no prejudice here because a, a gay person, a homosexual person, could just not hire heterosexuals. And so that would come out even. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is cool. Um, so I wonder, Michael and, and perhaps Chris, if you were old enough to remember, what was, was. I mean, what was the reaction in the community oh. when McClung brought down that ruling? Yes, I... I, um, I, okay. I, I, I don't know whether... It, whether you remember it or not, I, I certainly do. Go ahead. Yep. Um, um, because at the, at, the, at the first court, the decision had been in, in uh, what we wanted to have happen, uh, kind of thing in that. Um, um, th th there was, first of all, the, the disbelief. Although, as I recall, either you or one of the other lawyers had hinted we were in deep trouble, <laughs> kind of thing, in whatever way that, that you did. So, so let, let's just say we had our celebration party immediately after the hearing <laughs> so that we didn't have to wait for the judgment to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good then, plan. So, so we were, we were um, uh, hoping against hope kind of thing. And that, I mean, some of us are, are uh, you know, we're hopeful. Yeah, we're too hopeful. I know, I know, I know. I tried. Anyway, um, uh, and so there was, there was uh, both incredible, uh, and, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of upset. Um, I think we had a rally um, as well. And, and when, when his written statement came out, um, you know, what he actually said was, was so degrading and so awful. I mean, it's hard to not feel cheap as an individual and just awful kind of thing in that because it, it, you're talking about me. Uh, you know, and, and other people, you know, the kind of thing in that too. It was, it was, I mean, it was, uh, when I saw it again recently reading it, I, 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 I know how I blocked it out of my mind because it was just horrible uh, what was said. Um, and then, then we also were like, so what happens now? Is there any other thing that could be done? And we had no idea uh, on, on the level. M most of the other folks were involved were not lawyers like me. I'm not either. So it was like, I don't, you know. But Chris, I mean, what do you remember? I mean, you would have been, what, in university then? Yeah, uh, uh, well, I remember, and you go back and you read those decisions, some of the most homophobic judicial decisions that have ever been recorded in, in certainly in Alberta, and if not Canada, and the reaction was, it's open season. You know, walking down the street, going to the Pride Parade, and there were still people with paper bags over their head and eyes cut out. That was the, what I remember the most from my very first Pride Parade in the, the mid-90s, because uh, people were worried if somebody saw them or they were on the news, the next day they'd be like Dell and they'd be fired from their job. So there was a lot of fear and uncertainty and insecurity in the community. And our highest court was authorizing it. Mm -hmm. So you guys then set out to prepare for the appeal. Mm -hmm. So how did you pull together the team that, and, and, and the arguments that you were going to take to the Supreme Court? You pulled the money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we already you know, had the basics of the argument by the time we left the Court of Appeal. And I also think in retrospect, that that judgment, you know, it used very graphic language. It said, for example, homosexuality is against a millennia of moral teaching. Yeah. And it pitted the religious, he said, 
against the rights euphoric cost scoffing left. I mean, that's and you. Yeah, that's yeah. me. <laughs> so, yeah. rights, uh, rights euphoric. I mean, I like that. I, mean, I actually like it. I mean, McClung could write. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah, you could write. So, um, oh, it God. was almost uh, visceral. What, yeah. The kind of emotion that that judgment evokes. If anybody's interested, it's on online, mm -hmm. and I think it was a powerful argument for the Supreme Court of Canada to read that judgment and see what the tenor, the temperature was in Alberta and yeah. elsewhere. So, and as it turned out, ironically, it probably helped us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a line out of the judgment of, of Justice McClung. He was quoting from the Dred Scott case from oh, yeah. the. Uh, 1800s. It's the slavery case where the United States Supreme Court found there was nothing wrong with slavery. And, and there's a quote from that case that's along the lines of, I'd rather trust my dinner to my dog than this case to the Supreme Court. So Justice McClung and I cited barf. that, yep. and that mm -hmm. was the very first line of our application for leave <laughs> <laughs> to the Supreme Court of Canada, which we were hoping would catch their attention. <laughs> I think I have a spark in the hallway. So now, Julie, this is where you enter the story as a lawyer. Yeah. How did you come to be an intervener in the case, and what did it mean for you as a as a as a baby lawyer and a and a, and a les lesbian? It sounds weird that way, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's, what, did it, what did it mean for you personally to be well, the to Canadian, part of this? The Canadian Bar Association was um, asked, I think, probably by Sheila's team. Um, to be involved as an intervener, and then there was some discussion um, at the Canadian Bar Association. Ultimately, it went to a, a vote, and then there were three lawyers. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was the baby lawyer of three lawyers of an intervener. So um, uh, there were two other much more senior lawyers and than Jamie's, myself. I think Jamie's Jamie, here. There he is. Jamie McGinnis is here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, James Lebo was another lawyer, and um, so I was one of one of three of those lawyers. So. Um, that's how that whole thing happened. And but what and did I you, what did just but make what a comment about that too. I remember about six months later after all of this, it was a very unusual thing back in the day to intervene, mm -hmm. the Canadian Bar Association, but on the other hand, such a powerful voice to be yeah. on our side. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I don't know if I should say his name, one of the senior eminent grees of the legal profession accosting me in Jasper about what in the hell was the CBA doing yeah. <laughs> intervening <laughs> in that gay rights case. So because that was not an easy thing to yeah, do. Yeah, that was a bit of a fractious discussion that got yeah. there. Jamie probably has a little bit more information than I do, but, <laughs> but ultimately the power of the Canadian Bar Association as one of the interveners was some um, was was quite effective. I mean, the Canadian Jewish Congress intervened. Yeah. The Canadian Labour Congress Labor intervened. Congress, yeah. United Church of Canada intervened. Mm -hmm. I mean, on on the side of the angels, they were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were you know what? Seventeen intervenors in all. So, there was a horrific backlash. You were right in the center. Of yes, it. I was. So, what was that like for you? I mean, you were the most public gay person anybody yeah. anybody knew, and you were right in the eye of that. Yeah. It was probably uh, the toughest time for me, certainly in all of my time on, on the city council, one of the toughest times in probably my whole life. Um, uh, when the decision came down, on the th uh, which was a Thursday, um, uh, I actually was in Madison, Wisconsin with my mother, my sister-in-law, and two of my nieces and nephews who were at the University of Wisconsin. And I got a call from the office. Remember in these days, that's the only way you could reach me was the phone. Kind of thing. <laughs> and we were, we were supposed to be having lunch. And I got a call from my office at City Hall saying that there's all these media that want to talk to you. So I go outside the restaurant. And for the next 40 minutes, I'm on the phone kind of thing. And then my mother, when media I come back in, is, just you, terrible. I know, you can't be like that. But anyway, so, so I flew back. Um, uh, I missed the, the initial celebration at, at, at the uh, steps of the legislature. Um, and then on Saturday, um, it, it, it became both silent and then there was this kind of negative backlash. And on Sunday, it just exploded on the radio shows, on the media, it was all quoting that, that, that this province wouldn't, want, wouldn't do this, people don't want it. Um, they, were, they were doing all kinds of things with a number of groups who were very anti. Um, and there was this huge pallor. Um, and and um, you know, watch myself here that because then then and on Monday um, in in my office at City Hall we started to get uh, calls from people saying 
uh, awful things and uh, and more than awful things. Death, and, and death threats. And they talk, you know, about getting rid of me and people like me, and et cetera, and that. And and we, there were so many calls coming that that the city had to bring in a couple temporary people to help with the calls, kind of thing that were coming in. I mean, oh, to this day, I feel for those people that had to field those calls, kind of thing, and that. Um, and so um, I, I, that evening, um, I, I ran into two different people I knew well. Um, a, a, a woman who I know knew quite well, who, who I would say was a pretty strong individual. She said she was driving and she was listening to some radio talk shows. She said she, she um, it, it made her so angry she had to stop driving. She pulled off the side of the road and she said, I just couldn't continue. And, then, and I, I was really kind of taken aback. And then I, I, I had a call from, from a, a fellow I know and, and said, my parents called from the East Coast and they think I should come home as I worry about what's going on. So on Tuesday, as this got worse and then or more, um, and I tried to make a few calls to see whether we couldn't, with a couple of people in the media, a couple other places, try to turn this around. Um, I had the, the, I didn't even know the city had um, security in City Hall, uh, came to, to uh, see me with a couple of police officers uh, to change the, my route of going back and forth and also that, that they, were, they would be in the neighborhood where I lived, kind of thing and that, because we were, we were getting all kinds of, um, I was getting, and by extension, everybody else, and, you know, all kinds of death threats and all the rest of it. Um, we had a council meeting that day, and, and when my office, at, at just be around noontime, my office told me about some of the death threats that were coming, um, and some of the office things would said. And after lunch, and when we went back to the meeting, um, I, I, um, I, we have a process where, where I could have a chance to say, any member of my council could ask to say something, I did. And I said what was going on, and I said I can't stay, and that uh, I'm just too, too upset. Um, and so, <laughs> excuse me, so I, I, I got up and left, um, and I told my office I'm going home, I'm not answering the phone, kind of thing, and don't tell anybody where I am, kind of thing, and that. And so I went home, um, and in that evening, uh, I talked with uh, my executive assistant at the office, and um, decided that uh, what I should do was to do, uh, was to have a media conference on Wednesday um, with some, a couple other people who were involved with some of this as well as myself at City Hall um, and, and invite all the media kind of thing to come. And, and I was gonna talk about what was happening kind of thing in that. Um, and that. And so we, we did that, or we, they, my office sent that out. Um, we had all the national media, we had everybody kind of there. And I talked about what was happening and said that, that, that this was just unacceptable, that there are people like me that, that deserve to be here, to do what we can. We're citizens like everyone else. And these kind of things are terribly degrading. And, and the government, the provincial government, needs to be aware of what this is doing to people like me in our lives. And I said, it's got to stop and it's got to change. And, that, and, it, and, and the decision was what it should be and we, we, we can all live together and make this work. Um, and, I, and I can tell you that it was, that was one of the toughest things I ever did. Um, and um, at the same time, there was all the stuff going on within the ledge with, with the elected officials and what yeah, they were going so to do. We should maybe, yeah. for those of you who were not alive then, um, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the issue was with the notwithstanding clause. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this is actually a failure in my otherwise excellent piece on Saturday. <laughs> I, 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 I did not explain what the notwithstanding clause is and why, why there was this campaign for the government to introduce it. So what would, had the Alberta government invoked the notwithstanding clause, what would that have meant for, for the non-legal people? They would be absolved from having to follow the decision. And there's and no they could go about their merry way. And there's no appeal of the notwithstanding clause. It's a legislative clause. override of the court decision. Right. And it's been used very rarely in Canada. Right. So you've won. You're in your office. Oh. You're celebrating. And now you realize that you have not yet won. So what did you do? I mean, we, Michael's told us his very brave reaction. <coughs> What did, what did the two of you and the rest of the legal team do when it suddenly was clear that winning at the Supreme Court 
didn't necessarily mean that you were going to win. Well, at that point, it became a public relations fight. And um, the community organized very, very strongly. And Murray Billet was at the forefront right. of all of that in, in that period of time. And I know we took time off work. I certainly did. And my firm supported that. And we had Margaret Bateman's firm uh, doing our communications and organizing press conferences. And we rallied people to come to support our position. And by that, I mean we went to prominent people in the community who would step forward. I know the dean of the law school did, Lewis Clark, uh, Ron Gitter, the senator in Calgary did. Many people came forward right. uh, with power in the community that we didn't have, <laughs> I didn't certainly, um, to come forward and say, this is wrong what you're doing and you have to stop. And so we had press conferences, public meetings, letters, uh, phone calls, people that might not want to be publicly associated with the issue could make a phone call to the Premier and speak directly to him. So that was what it, it took about six weeks, I think, yeah. is and, my memory. And I love the story about your dad, Doug, if you would tell. Yeah, so my, my oh, yeah. dad was retired at that point, and, but he had a fax machine. And just so that you're clear, <laughs> his dad is Bob Stollery, like the hospital Bob Stollery. And, and he had a fax machine that he was very proud of. Uh, <laughs> it, was an it was a big it deal was in those days. Incredibly modern. He didn't have a typewriter, so he hand wrote everything. So he hand wrote a letter to the premier, and I went over one night, and there he was. And I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm, well, I'm feeding this into the machine." <laughs> I said, "But you've just done that." He said, "Well, of course. Like, as soon as it comes out, I feed it back in again." <laughs> <laughs> but to give that context, <laughs> immediately after the judgment, like within a couple of hours, they were interviewing the woman who was heading up uh, Focus Alberta, on the Alberta family. Women. Focus on the family. Alberta oh. Women United for Families. Alberta Women United for Families. Yes. Yes. I remember and so well. she was opposed to the decision, but, and you know, the arguments she was making were certainly ones we'd heard before. But what I found interesting was behind her was this giant poster invoked the notwithstanding clause. And I thought, where did that poster come from? Because the decision's only like a few hours old. Well, the opposition had been preparing yeah. for the judgment. Yeah. And the moment the judgment came out, oh, yeah. oh. an advertising campaign started. Print, uh, radio, television, yeah. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars went into this campaign. All there, all canned, here's your postcard, send it into the premier, uh, in the in some of the churches on the Sunday, right. postcards were being handed out, pre-done, sign here, send it in, it's all done, ready to go right. to the premier. Right. So what my dad was doing was realizing that there were like nine of us on our side <laughs> and, <laughs> and three and a half million on the other, he decided that he would use the fax machine <laughs> to increase the number that would be recorded on our side. <laughs> Where did you get so funny? <laughs> now, I, I, I just have to I just put in a little plug here for the Edmonton Journal. Uh, I have to say, this was one of our finest hours, uh, at least as an editorial board. Our editor-in-chief, Murdoch Davis, with the backing of our publisher, Linda Hughes. Who's here tonight. Here tonight. Yes. Yes. Murdoch wrote a truly extraordinary editorial in which he called out the Klein government, called them bigots. Um, I mean, it's an extraordinary editorial. It's in Saturday's paper, if you want to have a look. <laughs> um, I, I, I reprinted it because it had such a huge influence on me personally. And at the end of the editorial, in a very Murdoch mischievous fashion, he put the phone numbers for the MLAs that you were supposed to call. <laughs> Would you like to call Stockwell Day? This is Stockwell Day's number. Would you like to call John Havelock? This is John Havelock's direct line. How about Dave Hancock? Here's the direct number for Dave Hancock. Uh, and I think it really made a difference. I think the paper spoke with a really authoritative moral voice. And Murdoch, it was, it was really a, a call to arms. That said, when I went back and looked at the paper, I was not a columnist at the time. I was a reporter, and I was writing stories about this. But some of our columns, you know, Lauren Guncher wrote a piece in which he suggested that we should invoke the notwithstanding clause. And then he wrote a second column in which he said, Michael Fair says he got, well, I got threats too. 
I, and, and some people won't ride in the elevator with me, and so my feelings are also hurt. <laughs> and I thought, okay. So, I mean, it was, it was a different time. Yeah. The Calgary Herald's editorial said, homosexuals are flexing their muscles. Um, <laughs> That's Michael, awesome. they weren't talking about that. <laughs> I'm sure they were. <laughs> so, Julie, at the time, I actually interviewed you. Mm. And I've pulled the story, oh, and I'm going to read you what you said. Okay. Really what you said. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> when it first hit me was when I was leaving the rally at the legislature on Thursday. I got to the end of the reflecting pool, and I turned around and looked back at the building, and suddenly it looked different to me. It was a place all of a sudden that I was part of that didn't require me to pretend to be someone I wasn't. When I woke up this morning, I thought, this is a different place. Now who I am is just fine. Who I am is not licensed to treat me in a way that is different from anybody else. It's really quite a remarkable feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think the Vreen decision did that 20 years later? Oh yeah. It absolutely did. Uh, it absolutely did. Just reading that decision, I mean, I, I think you should get a, a law school credit for just reading the decision. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it reminds us how oh, yeah. central equality is to democracy. It tells us that this is a group of people who we need to celebrate and not discriminate against. It reminds us who we are as a country. And so that, that the, the, the volume of that decision increases, I think, over time. And um, I, I remember that, that um, the, the situation that gave rise to that quote very well, because I, I did look at that, that building, and it did look different to me. And as a lesbian, to look at it, it wasn't until that moment that I realized what I used to see. And what I used to see was somebody who didn't, who, who, who was excluded and didn't fit in. And it was that moment and those ringing words that made that building and the province look different for me. And in speaking to other um, gay and lesbian friends, that was the experience. And it was being able to take a deep breath in, in our community. And um, so it was, it, it was big. Yeah. So it should be said, Ralph Klein did not invoke the notwithstanding clause. Um, that was on, on Thursday <laughs> that, that it, they it, officially it, announced it. it. Yeah, it took, took a week. week. Yeah. It was exactly that, a right. week. And it was, that was the day before Good Friday. Friday. That's the only reason I remember. And so on Saturday, I went out and bought a new shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael, it's a very nice shirt. <laughs> out of the archives. Yeah. I still have it. <laughs> so now I want to talk about the downstream import of the decision. So Chris, you talked about how you had to be in the closet as a teacher. How do you think the Vreen decision changed the teaching profession? Well, right away after the Vreen decision, the Alberta Teachers Association was one of the first major institutions in our province to take action. So they brought forward a resolution be, uh, before their annual representative assembly, uh, 1999, so right one year thereafter, to put sexual orientation into the code of professional conduct. I can tell you the code is like the charter. It doesn't change easily. <laughs> and it had to go before um, all of the teachers in the province to vote. And just a couple years before, when British Columbia and their teachers moved forward by including sexual orientation, there were protests outside of the assembly and when it came time for the teachers they voted overwhelmingly in favor and it set the ATA in motion for the next decade 2003 they became the first teacher association in Canada to include gender identity right think about that 2003 and 2005 they passed a resolution to support gay straight alliances in schools it would take the government 10 years to catch up to where the teachers were for GSAs. And then it moved forward into policing and other institutions in society. It was almost like the game of dominoes. You had to set one up first and then line the others up for them to follow, fall in order. So Julie, that leads to my question to you. What did Vreen allow you to do as a litigator, as a civil rights lawyer, to, to win other cases here? 
um, it was it was critical. It was critical to know that sexual orientation was now um, an analogous ground in Section 15 of the Charter. It was still a question because, as Doug talked about, Egan was the uh, perhaps the law was that Vreen means that you can't discriminate against individual gay and lesbian people, but Egan said that maybe you can still discriminate against couples, and so that was still chugging along, and it took a while to sort of um, resolve that situation. So. I was kind of sweeping up after the parade of the work that Sheila and Doug did, <laughs> working, you know, to, to challenge pieces of provincial legislation that excluded gay and lesbian couples from the laws. And it was it was a weird situation because the the the, the problem existed for gay couples or for same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples. The solution existed: spousal support and testacy laws, pension benefits laws, but but they didn't apply to same-sex couples. And so it was just kind of this plodding one foot in front of the other of going after one statute and then another to get that sorted out. So without Vreen, it wouldn't have been possible to do that. Another decision of M and H was an, was important as well to solve that other problem that in fact you can't treat same-sex couples couples differently than opposite sex couples but that was kind of the next step but we wouldn't have been there without this the ringing um, language of Vreen. Yeah. So and it, it takes a decade to get from Vreen to gay marriage. The, the wheels of justice grind <laughs> slow <laughs> I guess. but they grind fine I think Mr. Dolboy yes. told me they, that. They grind <laughs> exceeding small I yes. think. Yes. So Michael once What's the, they stopped burning torches outside of your house? <laughs> <laughs> what did Vreen mean for you personally? Oh, heavens. Um, well, it, it, it was, um, uh, first of all, um, I think I, I, I found it difficult to believe it happened. Kind of, you know, after many years in this province pushing for this and advocating for, by that point, I suppose 15 years with people in different groups than the rest, it was just kind of uh, extremely liberating. It also meant, for example, at city council, um, I, I was out, of course, but it also gave a whole different dimension, particularly within the city administration and the rest of that, too. When, when I had this really difficult time and, and getting all the rest of it, I got hundreds of emails uh, from people who work in the city who, who, who were saying the opposite you know you're a good person um we're glad you're here and stuff, and stuff like that <laughs> so um i found it personally very very um encouraging um and the rest and 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 i, I mentioned about good friday and the rest of e by an easter by easter monday it was all over well that, i mean that's the thing it, it was, was all it was over. almost like lancing a boil exactly. right i mean it's like it was like this it was yep. like this explosion yep. of pussy hatred yep. and then <laughs> it does and it was done and gone and that and so that that was the other part that was pretty i think the other that that starts to lead to some of what uh, julie said and also when you're getting towards marriage is it d did mean we could work at some other things finally i mean we've been concentrating for years on trying to get the the legislation change to include us in, so that we wouldn't discriminate against. And all of a sudden, that was done. So we could do other things. That it, was, it was very, very uh, opening for that, too. So, and the, you know, the city already had a variety of things, but it meant um, for, for pensions and all the rest of it, for the city, all that stuff, all of a sudden, blah, blah, blah. So I want to ask maybe Sheila and Doug and Julie this question. We've talked about what the Vreen decision meant for LGBT. I'm sorry, you guys keep adding letters. No. For, for, for the alphabet, yeah. for the alphabet people. Yeah. Um, but what did it mean for the way the Supreme Court mm. moved forward? Because at the time there was a, you know, pe the polite thing, it's just like, you know, just like people say it's always about the parking. Um, people <laughs> said, well, it, I have no problem with homosexuals, I just don't like an activist court. That was the, that was the sort of shield that the yeah. polite people, mm -hmm. the polite homophobes. Yeah. But do you think that Vreen did signal a change in direction for the Supreme Court or for the judiciary in Canada to become more muscular? I, I don't think we use that language, activist court, the way they do in the United States. We're not, first of all, I would argue, political in the same way. And I think that the Charter of Rights had within it, and still has within it, the constitutional framework to allow for equality rights to move forward with the times. It's described as a living tree approach, so that as, as the community changes, as our mores change, as we understand what equality means to different disadvantaged groups, the law is there ready to respond. 
so to me, the courts are doing what they're required to do under the charter. They're not activists. They're interpreting the charter that's there. And that's precisely what the Supreme Court of Canada said mm -hmm. to the arguments that they were stepping into new territory and doing things that were not the purview of the court. The Supreme Court said, this is what the Constitution mandates us to do. It's not a question of whether we want to do this or don't want to do it. We live in a country with a constitution, and the constitution says the court shall review legislation when brought before it to see, for example, if it complies with the equality rights under the charter. Mm -hmm. So they were doing precisely what the constitution of our country tells them they must do. And that's part of a robust constitutional democracy. Democracy is working the way it should, and people vote, and there's majoritarian stuff going on, but then you've got the backbone of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and those are inalienable, and those are given to the courts, to, uh, to police, I guess, in a way. So it's, it's checks and balances. You have the majoritarian, and you have the constitutional structure. It's a constitutional democracy. It's not just the, the majority of the day running roughshod over everybody. We have a structure and the structure matters. Now, we've talked a little bit, we've alluded to, I think, off and on through the evening about the newer chapters, the newer, the newer battles still to fight. I have to say this is a pretty cis panel. See, I can say cis because I've got a 21-year-old daughter and I'm super cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a very cis panel. There is no one here who is trans. There is no one here who is gender neutral or twin-spirited, two-spirited. So maybe this is a tough question for us to ask or to answer as this panel. But maybe I get Julie or Chris to try. To what extent did Vreend lay the groundwork for trans rights and what can the trans community, I guess, take away? I mean, since my piece went online, I've heard from quite a few people in the trans community who are very angry and said, we were left behind. This didn't help us. I mean, do you think that Vreend, I mean, did it just take 20 years for Vreend to help them? <laughs> or, I don't know, I'm asking this question badly. But. Well, I can tell you my experience in my own practice. When Vreend was done, then I started to get a lot of phone calls from trans people. And I, I was surprised by that, and, and I had the sense, I, I, my hope was that the success of Vreemd um, empowered trans people to think that perhaps um, the situation uh, was, there was more hope and so more energy to the fights. I had more employment cases where mm -hmm. trans people were coming forward and saying, I need to come out at work, I need to transition. And that started to happen in my own anecdotal experience. That started to happen, and, and I, I hope it's still happening today. So Chris, you've got a finger a little bit more on the pulse than I do. What's going on? Well, I think Green, for many, was Alberta's Stonewall. It was that galvanizing moment where allies and communities came together to fight back against what was state government oppression and won and realized, you know, we could keep using the law and keep using the tools that were available. People like Julie and others who were plodding along, striking down the legislation, making the changes because the government wasn't going to do it on its own. Right? And so I think it, it created a pathway and an opening for other identities, other experiences to walk through, right? Without Vreend and, and you know, uh, I guess toiling the garden, the road, it allowed uh, other experiences and identities to come together. And, w and we're seeing that play out right now in our school systems and places where, you know, trans youth are still fighting to be able to use the, the bathrooms. There's something as simple as that. And the visceral kind of backlash or the stereotypes that are being portrayed of gay and lesbian people 20 years ago are what many trans individuals are dealing with now. So I'm hopeful we can catch up a lot quicker and we can build these coalitions and these uh, allies to walk through these doors of equality together. I mean, certainly when I spoke to Delwyn last month, he said to me that to his mind, this was always as much a case about trans people as anything else. And he said, it's, he, to him, it was about everyone. It was equality for everybody. But I guess it takes a while. One of the lessons that I think um, Sheila's, um, the way she managed this case, I think really underscored is the importance of allies. 
Um, yep. Sheila was really careful to bring along interveners and after the Vereen decision when this whole notwithstanding stuff hit the fan there were a lot of allies because it's not fair to make Michael it's not fair and it, and it isn't even effective for the impugned minority to come forward and say please don't hate me it, it's, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of you know even if you say it like really mad it's, it doesn't have the effect of people who are allies and who are already in the mainstream and have the, the, the legitimacy and can say those things and so it's our role to be those allies and those voices for our trans brothers and sisters as well and that's a lesson that Vreen taught us as well that we need to be our each other's allies right so I want to talk to, to Doug and Sheila about that you really did put together a remarkably diverse range of interveners not just the usual suspects I mean the the, 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 the human rights commissions were there the civil liberties groups were there but also I mean, I love that Ritu Kular, who's now the first South Asian judge, represented the United Church. She didn't grow up in the United Church. Um, Sharice Shatalia was there representing the Alberta Civil Liberties. She's here yeah. tonight, too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was ethno-culturally diverse, it was religiously diverse. I mean, you know, uh, the, the intervener for the Jewish Congress, I was very proud as a semi-Jewish person. <laughs> um, just, I'm just re-watching that on the weekend. It was the gave most me powerful, actually the most powerful submission, I think, of all of them. Yes. Because the idea was, and, and I think Lyle made a quoted from a very famous saying that mm -hmm. first they came for the gypsies and I didn't stand up. And then they came for the Jews and I didn't stand up. And then and then and, and they then. And they came for the Catholics. And, and when they came for me, there was no one left to speak. Yeah. Right. And Chris's point exactly, which is that we actually, those of us that have a voice, we need to be the ones standing up. Uh, whether, because it's so much more difficult when you're the subject of discrimination than when you're there as an advocate standing up for what's right and just in the community. So, so how do we do that going forward? I mean, um, Minister Miranda used that word intersectionality, which I sometimes hate because it makes me sound like I'm tra crossing the street, but uh, yeah. <laughs> without gondolas. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then how, how do you build and sustain those alliances? How do you make sure that you're not privileging the pre-privileged? How do you make sure that, that everybody in that coalition of voices gets their due? And that we aren't, you know, that we aren't a narrative that is with one voice. Well, you know what? Until tonight, I never actually acknowledged how much we were involved in getting all those people together. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Because Sorry. I, wasn't I thought sure. it was a secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you'd like to it think the community happened, just right? sprung it, up yeah. and came forward, yeah. but actually, you know, oh, no. actually there was quite a bit of organizing that went on to get mm -hmm. strategizing to make yeah. sure all the voices were there. Um, but that needs to happen on a go-forward basis. Mm -hmm. And as we're all talking about this tonight, I'm always thinking now, maybe it's because of my new job, or my job for the last 15 years, about First Nations <laughs> new, people. Newish job. Newish <laughs> job. <laughs> Life is long, we learn, <laughs> when yeah. we get old. But my new-ish job, uh, I think about First Nations people, and I'm wondering if, you know, it's got to come from the community first. Yeah. As mm -hmm. with you, and as with you, and as with this case. First it came from the mu community, but then everyone has to chime in. And are we doing it enough with First Nations people? That's the thing that I'm thinking about right now. Yes. You know, the rest of us, are we? Yeah. So, so that's the thing. I guess we need to be always conscious that there's somebody that needs our voice. Yeah, and then to, you know, for mm -hmm. a group that... It I think just as the Canadian Jewish Congress stood shoulder to shoulder with gays and lesbians, you know, you, you have to take the, the victories that you've learned and, and pay them forward to other groups. Right. Mm -hmm. So 20 years on, the chair of the Board of Governors of the U of A is gay. The chancellor of the University of Alberta is, 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 is gay. The dean of the School of Law also. Um, so that's nice for all of you, but Chris, do you think that do you think that makes a difference to the student body? Does that send a message to today's queer <laughs> students? If the, if the senior leadership of your university is out and proud, what difference does that make 
if you're 20 and still coming to terms with your sexual, sexual identity? Well, I can remember going back to the, the mid-90s and, and going to a, a house party and being sort of introduced to the, the, the community and um, somebody took me aside and said, you see that person over there? There's a doctor, there's a lawyer, there's a dentist. And my mind was just blown. I didn't think you could be gay and be a professional because there were no role models. There was no visibility whatsoever and it just completely changed my world and my perception. So I think that visibility and that representation matters. It'll get, maybe it'll get you in the door, but then it's what do you do with it, right? How are you creating that space and the privilege that we have to create opportunity for others? On our own campus a few years ago when we did our, our first safe space survey to ask you know undergraduates about their experience and the first thing that they they said was yeah we feel relatively safe on our, our campus but we necessarily don't feel that supported by our institution and that's how University of Alberta Pride Week was launched was a message for our institution to say to our students in our community we value you we see you, we honor you, and perhaps now at the University of Alberta, it's not as big of a deal to come out, but how uh, much our province has changed and our university has changed, I think our real focus is now inviting our alumni, all those people who had to leave the university to find jobs, to leave the province to find you know, partners. I call it the MTV effect, Mo Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, where you had to go to, <laughs> to find community and to find your future. And we need to invite people back into the university and into our province and see how remarkably we've changed. We've become leaders on LGBTQ issues in so many issues. When you travel across the Canada and people are saying, you're doing what, where, in Alberta? <laughs> And I say, if we can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Doug and Julie, I interviewed you in two separate phone interviews. You didn't hear one another. But you both used the same phrase to me. You talked about vigilance, how we need to be vigilant. So what, what do we need to be vigilant about at the moment? Well, <laughs> um, the laws are there. I mean, the laws are there and they lie there on a page. It's brave clients and smart lawyers who take those laws and bring them into courtrooms. And that's how um, the Canadian um, community is whipped into shape. The, the, the pieces, the words just sit there. And so we do need to be vigilant. We need to be vigilant and in seeing where uh, minority rights are not, being, um, are not being championed, are not being looked after. Um, so we need to be vigilant. So say that more eloquently there, Doug. Maybe we were a fax machine in there. Yep. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. I, used, I used that one. <laughs> <laughs> Those who forget history are doomed to repeat the past. Mm -hmm. Those who forget the struggle that we went through are at risk of ending up where we were. We have to be aware of our history, and we have to fight every day to maintain the rights that we've gained and to make sure that those rights are available not only to us, but to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I won't ask the judges this question. I will ask the, the, the non-judges this question. When you look at the political climate out there right now, whether it's south of the border or south of the river, uh, north of the river, we're south of the river. <laughs> south of the border or north of the river, that's what I'm saying. Um, do you see things that are ominous echoes or oh, things no. that, that, oh yeah, 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 I mean, I do, I do think, I, I, I just, I did want to add though that, that with a lot of that, that struggle, um, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the success that achieved and that people don't have, most people don't have to go through some of that. I think sometimes people think that, uh, oh, you know, folks these days, you know, they have it easy. It's like, oh, no, give me a break. That's what we did the work for. We wanted them to be able to have a better life than, than, and go through things that we had to go through. So I can't tell you how pleased I am about that. But it also means that there are new things to be dealt with. Um, and, and I think that um, I do worry about what's going on south of the border. Um, I, I, I've been here long enough to realize the influence that that has and what we get on our TV and blah, 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 blah kind of thing and that. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that 
some of what we're seeing, people are starting to get used to. And that's the way it is, you know, kind of thing in that. And I worry how that might cascade in, in, in uh, Edmonton and, and the country as a whole. I mean, we've been making fun of Bob Stollery's fax machine. Uh, <laughs> yes, but, yeah, Twitter. And but I'm trying to imagine what it would have been like if Reend had come out in an age of Twitter. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I don't think it would have been better. No, 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 no. And it, it, it's a different means of doing it, though, because he had things written on, on paper that were taped to his door at the university, at, the, at King's College, by students. Or probably, he doesn't know that. Delwyn. Delwyn, yeah. Delwyn did, yeah. yeah. Delwyn, so, not Bob. Sorry, 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 yes, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a different means of, of uh, finding ways to be... Yeah, quite negatively, but you can find ways to be positive too. Uh, but I do think that that um, um, it, there is a great deal to do, and as much as Julie was was saying that the that the charter is a living, uh, like a living tree, I think struggles are a living tree as well. And that, and you know, we we've done some things to put some leaves on the tree, and now we want to get some red leaves on it, and some yellow leaves, and some others to to fill, keep. You just want to decorate that tree, my that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, <laughs> and I would know how to do that. <laughs> Paul, if I can just add to that, I'm worried not just about south of the border. I'm worried about east and west and north of the border yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. well. Seventy countries in the world, it's a yeah. criminal offense to have a same-sex relationship. Yeah. 10 countries in the world, the penalty is death. So yeah. we've got a long way to go in the world. We've made great progress in Canada, but easily half the population of the world today lives in an environment <coughs> where they can be imprisoned or executed for being who they are. Yeah. The one positive thing I could say to that is, last year, decision of the Supreme Court of Belize struck down the anti-sodomy laws of the country of Belize, citing Green versus Alberta. Vreen, it strikes me, was like a kind of legal, I don't know if it was a boot camp, a finishing school. I don't know, you have to pick your, <laughs> pick your metaphor. <laughs> Sheila, you ended up, I mean, at the time of the decision, you were a lawyer. You ended up on the Court of Queen's Bench and then on the Court of Appeal. Richard Kular, who was an intervener for the United Church, was named to the Court of Appeal last week. Uh, June Ross, who was part of your team, is a member of the Court of Queen's Bench. Julie was named a judge last year. Sharesh Shatalia went on to head the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Now, is that just because you got the best people, as somebody would say? <laughs> <laughs> or do you think that working on the case shaped, I mean, did it shape a, a generation of legal leaders? Because uh, they had the chance to work on the case. But you know, my view has always been not a competitive one in law. I always wanted to have the very best people around and get people smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get everybody together t that could do the very best job on any case that we ever took. And so, to me, it wasn't a competitive sport. It was a team sport. Now, so, but you know what I mean? The Vreen so, alumni have gone on to... Well, I guess it's a self-selecting group in a certain way. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer that any better than that. But I guess the people who were brave enough to, to step up. Right. They had, a, they had a, a set of values, I guess. Right. That would be the one common mm -hmm. feature. And the other would be mostly really good training. So, yeah. so I want to end then with a question to the Chancellor, because this is the Chancellor's forum. This is his party. Um, <laughs> and he's not going to no cry. cry. Well, so. I almost <laughs> did. <laughs> And we're not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> this Chancellor's Forum is, in its way, a celebration of the contributions of the University of Alberta to the uplifting of the whole people. Uh, most of us here, I think except Michael, are U of A grads, but he's the chair of the Board of Governors, so we'll let him, we'll let him be part of the panel. Uh, most of the Vreen legal team were U of A grads, or in some way U of A affiliated. Is that just an accident of geography? Or do you think there is something about this university that helped shape the morality and the courage of the people who stepped forward? It's the water. <laughs> I think that we learned here basic values that helped to inspire people to step forward. Um, we, it was an unpopular case. There were risks. People were courageous. Uh, and they came out of this law school. So I think those two fit. Well, 
I cannot tell you what a privilege it has been to be your moderator this evening. Thank you all of you who found the engineering building <laughs> and came here tonight. Thank you to Michael, to Sheila, to Doug, to Julie, to Chris, not just for being a fabulous panel this evening, but for everything you did to make equality rights for all Canadians, all Canadians, coast to coast possible. So thank you. Thank you.